I'm Tony Lockwood, founder of Thompson Wright Partners, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest episode of Inside Track, where I discuss business transformation journeys with leading figures in industry. Jane Logie joins me on the virtual sofa today. Jane has a great reputation for delivering change and transformation across many organizations. She has pulled together her skills and knowledge into a new book, which she talks about on the, on the podcast. Um, and it's surely one that you should try to get your hands on in due course. So, hi, Jane. Thanks, uh, thanks for agreeing to, uh, to join the podcast today. Uh, great to have you on the show. Uh, shall we start like we always do by you sharing a little bit about your background and how you got into change and transformation in the first place? Hi, Tony. Thank you for inviting me along. Uh, yes, we can. So, um, I didn't really intend to get into change, but I think that's sort of fairly common when you when you sort of speak to people like me. You don't set out sort of thinking, you know, my career is going to be spent in transformation, whatever that might mean. Um, I started out in logistics. I worked for um, United Parcel Service um, when they first were expanding out of America. So when I joined them, they were um, wholly owned by their employees um, and massive in, massive in the USA, but they had little or no presence in Europe. Uh, and by the time I left, we were in, I think, 197 countries and territories. And um, I was just happy, I just happily joined them at that time where they were doing this massive expansion. And I got to do all sorts of things whilst I worked with them as they expanded into Europe and bought businesses. Uh, and then had to integrate those businesses, close parts of business, integrate things like their feeder networks, their hubs, you know, their package distribution uh, assets, if you like, across Europe. Um, and, you know, it's just a great time. And I, I just I, I just found myself uh, constantly exposed to and then after a while sort of leading change. And I eventually ended up I went to work in Atlanta. Uh, for a little while uh, with UPS and helped to, to design what became their current generation of worldwide tra- tracking, you know, and package management systems. So, so I sort of started off in logistics, but ended up in change, but still very much focused on in the logistics space. Uh, and then I um, I met my husband at legal at, at UPS, sorry, and that was an absolute no-no. You weren't allowed to fraternise with anyone, um, and so and it was the rule that the most senior person had to leave. So oh, if wow. you're going to do anything, yeah, the most senior. And at the time, I was more senior to my husband, who was um, in industrial engineering, uh, and I left and I joined um, Legal and General, Legal and General uh, Assurance, who most of you yeah. all know, and. Uh, one of the things that I really liked when I joined Legal and General was they said to me, uh, they asked me, I, ca- I went in to help them sort out their contact centre. They'd, they'd set up a contact centre and it wasn't performing very well at all. And, and I went in to help them try and sort it out because I'd done quite a lot of that with UPS. Um, but one of the things that really attracted me to joining them was they promised me that I would never have to go abroad. And I was heartily sick of travelling because when I was with UPS, I spent half my life on a plane. Uh, and half of my life out of the UK. And they promised me basically I wouldn't have to travel. And I kept that promise for a little while, apart from the four (laughs) years they sent me to Egypt uh, (laughs) to set up a life insurance company. But with uh, with Legal and General, I uh, ran uh, big bits of their operation, but I also always was involved in change in one way or another. Um, as I say, doing things as diverse as setting up a, a new life insurance company sponsored by the World Bank in Cairo, through to replatforming their businesses, uh, reorganizing and repositioning their shared service model, but always operational, but with change. Uh, and then after many very happy and very successful years at uh, Legal and General. Um, John Pollock, who was one of their group board directors, came up to retirement. And to be honest, I couldn't really see life at Legal and General without John. And there was an opportunity to take redundancy. And I just jumped at it. I thought, great. I've worked really hard all my life. I wanted to take a break. I wanted to write a book. I, I'd always fancied writing a book and I wanted to take a break. So I thought, this is it. I'll take, I'll take redundancy and I'll have like a year off. And I took redundancy 
and I was working the week that I left, uh, helping another consulting organisation to uh, sort out a change in IT function that was a bit broken. Uh, and that's six and a half or seven years ago now. And I've had, it's fair to say, I've had less holidays since I became an independent than I had when I worked for Legal and General. Uh, and I've spent all of that time doing doing two things. One, um, helping mend broken IT and change functions or IT mm -hmm. and change functions that don't get along and can't deliver uh, or need just streamlining and organising for the future or fixing broken transformation programmes. So a lot of time doing assessment, investigative work, trying to work out what's wrong and then, yeah, just getting sleeves rolled up and fixing it. So, so, so didn't plan to end up in change, but I've kind of been involved in change my entire life and I, I don't think I'd be any good doing anything else. Uh, John Pollock, who I mentioned from Legal in General, he used to say to me, don't give Jane a job in BAU, she'll break whatever you give her because there's no <laughs> such thing as leaving anything alone. <laughs> Interesting. So, so, so that's how I got into change. <laughs> uh, but it's fascinating though, isn't it? it you know, the you know, experience with the UPS uh, being there as they went through that massive growth. Yeah. That's a great, great uh, um, grounding in change, I find. Um, I, I was fortunate to be involved in a couple of organisations as they went through significant growth. Uh, and and it's it's almost that new frontiers, isn't it? Every every other week or so, and and it, it's I wouldn't say necessarily making it up as you go, but a lot of it is. It, it's it, you know, people are doing things for the first time, and you've just got to find a way through, and you've got to take the people on that journey, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and you've got to bring teams together very very quickly, and and that's not too dissimilar, I don't think, when you step back in terms of how people run transformation you've got to bring teams together you've got to be quite agile and in, in the true sense of the word and and, and and make sense of things as you go along and when you hit a stumbling block look for ways of overcoming it I don't know about you but I do look back sometimes and I do think my goodness you know they let me do things that you know if, if I were in their shoes would I let somebody so green do it but you know at the end of the day nobody died Things got no. done, organisations got, you know, bought, merged and, you know, whatever. Uh, but I, th I think you're right. You know, if you can, I think if you can join an organisation as they are going themselves through something so big and you can uh, get involved in it, you know, get yourself get yourself into the forefront of what's going on. It's, it's a fascin fascinating sort of learning opportunity, isn't it, Tony? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. The other one, though, that was a massive learning opportunity for me was Cairo, because, um, as I say, I was out there to set up a, a life insurance company and I ended up doing things that legal and general would never have let me do. So I, you know, looked after all the finance functions, fund management, pricing, you know, investment policy. I, you know, I, I literally got to do stuff that, you know, I'd have had to be an actuary or an accountant in the UK and quite senior to make those types of decisions. So I think, again, you know, startups are, are great places, aren't they, to, yeah, to, to learn lessons, you know, about how to get stuff done and stuff done. Uh, it's interesting, though. I think you have to be a particular type of person that thrives in a startup. Um, you've got to be accepting of the fact that actually there are these big voids and you've just got to step into it and work out what needs to happen as you go through. Um, if, if, if you are very structured and, and, uh, and, and want to do a lot of the analysis up front, but sometimes that just doesn't work. You know, I was talking to someone the other day and, and, and they were saying, you know, they'd had a really, really successful career, quite senior in, in, in their sector. Um, and um, um, the, the lady was saying, oh, I'd really like to get involved in a startup. But when you started to go underneath why and, and what were they expecting, um, it was quite very quickly apparent that actually that she wouldn't have enjoyed it if she went into it um, because of that, that uncertainty and that, that 
um, yeah, that just that general uncertainty. Yeah, I think there's uncertainty, you know, and it's it's definitely not for the faint of heart, you know, because mm. um, I, I I honestly did stuff every day that was new to me and that scared me a little bit. But, you know, you just had to get it done because, hey, at the end of the day, who else was going to do it? You know, <laughs> there's nobody going to magically arrive and, you know, make that decision for you. And, um, yeah, definitely for people who, again, you know, kind of thrive a little bit in the in the grey, you know, operating where there isn't a rule book, um, which isn't for everyone, is it? Not at all, not at all. So given what you've done and yeah. um, and, and given, um, we'll come on to your book that, that, that you've written yeah. in, in, in a while, but it'd be good just to um, get your definition of transformation. So the word transformation, right. So in my opinion, it just gets terribly misused. Uh, I see it all over the place in job ads and then I read the ad and it's really not about transformation at all. Uh, I see it in people's titles. I talk to them and they're nothing to do with transformation even. So, so, so it means lots of different things to lots of people. And I think that's OK. I think, think that is OK. But but to me, to me, so I think transformation applies when you're trying to do something big. So you're looking at things like generating a big new value stream for your organisation or unlocking a whole new set of opportunities, maybe new markets, new customer segments that you've not operated in before, new industries, or you want to achieve something big around efficiency through the creation of like a big new business model. Um, it, it's, it's something that is almost driven in a way uh, by all sorts of disruption around you in the market. So really big things happening that you see as either a massive threat or or indeed a gigantic opportunity. And that turbulence, you're willing, you're willing, and this is the this is the thing for me, you're willing to put your organization that you have built through something that is that is going to be it's going to be painful, no matter how we like to dress it up. You know, we are all going to have to change in some way. And that is, uh, you know, kind of mentally and emotionally difficult for organisations to do, because at the end of the day, they're all just people, aren't they? But at the end of the transformation, it, it should be, you should be in a position where you are able to now to create that new value or you're in that new you know, customer segment, or you've got those new and different products engineered and in the market selling well. Um, what it isn't for me at all is, and I know people will argue with me, but it's not about small scale incremental improvement. It's that that might get you over a long period of time to quite a different state if you consistently apply, you know, incremental improvement and change. It's not, it's not just about putting in some new technology. Uh, you know, often there is a technology component to it, as we all know, but it's not just about that. Um, and it is, and it is by its very nature, something that I believe, I, I personally believe, is the domain of people with expertise. Because unless you know what you're doing, you can really screw it up. Mm -hmm. And... Most most big transformations are the subject matter and of, of board approvals, you know, and often sit, the city is looking in at what you're doing, you know, is your strategy going to give you a successful future? And the downside of getting it wrong is so, it's so big for the organisation that I sometimes wonder why people wouldn't consider it the domain of an of an of expertise and expert in it. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't decide to conduct your own open heart surgery, would you? But 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 we decide to give it a go. Yeah, yeah I, I, and I think I do believe it is that is changing. I think if you um, now look across the sort of FTSE, um, a lot of them now have got chief transformation officers or. Um, um, you know, chief change officers uh, sitting on the board, um, on the main board. 
Um, so, so I think that's that's a good sign that they're actually on the same table. On, on you know, they're, they're working with the, the, the peers across across the different functions. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think um, it's it's almost been. Um, I hesitate to say this, but it, it's it's almost been um, um, chief exec saying we're doing this. It's a big transformation to the city. Now, bugger off, because it's going to take us three years, and yeah. it's almost a way of getting that period of time so they can just do what they want to do, yeah. um, and and let's let's package it as a big transformation. When in reality, in some cases, they're, 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 they're anything but. So, uh, really so sorry, Tony. I think it's really encouraging seeing you know transformation uh, at the top table. So, so my question to you is: so, so the chief transformation officers, you know, are they practitioners? I I come across quite a lot of them that I would say aren't. I, I think they're more strategists than transformation. I, I don't know. It's a question. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I'm, I'm sure there's there's a whole range of people out there that you know you could looking at looking looking at them through different lenses. You could say they're good, bad, or indifferent, uh, depending upon the lens you look through. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I think a lot of them have come from that strategy perspective, and, and I suppose that that's not necessarily a bad place to come because you know ultimately going back to your definition, and I share it. It's about moving from fundamentally moving an organization from one state to a different state. So you need to have that absolute clarity mm. about that vision and what, what the future looks like um, and why you're moving there and what's the what's you know what's the strategic uh, element of moving from A to B. Um, so that's that's a good place to start. Um, mm. whether or not a whether or not a strategist has the necessary skills and experience to drive the change and take people on the journey etc cetera, etc cetera. um i don't know you know some some will and some won't yeah yeah i just so, asked a question because it interests me carry on sorry no no i was just going to say i was just coming back i mentioned it earlier and, and um you you're saying earlier that you were interested in writing a book and i know you've just pub had one published um and and i just find the title fascinating getting transformation right Yes. So uh, I thought it was it was optimal time to bring that in now. So do you want to just provide provide the listeners with a quick synopsis of the approach that you cover within the book? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Thanks, Tony. So um, yeah, I've wanted to write this book for a little while, um, and I finally got to the point where I'd got a break in the work I was doing, and I decided I was going to take a, a year out, and I was going to write, and I was going to do some thinking before I did some writing because that's quite important. Um, but the one thing that struck me, and I, I, I still, it, it, I've spoken to so many other people, and it, and they have had this experience also, is that um, particularly when you go into organisations to do assurance type activities or to have a look at why a program is struggling and to think about how you can kind of fix it. Um, it's really, really rare to find, you know, sort of a new or novel problem. Mm. Uh, wherever you go, it seems that it is the same sort of underlying, you know, causes exist, uh, whether that be, you know, stuff like, lack of strategy, lack of clear direction, not really knowing what it is the end result will look like through to the structure of the teams, whether that's uh, able to function or not, um, through to delivery mechanics, methods being used. You know, it's it's always the same. Oh, suppliers out of control. That's another one that you constantly yeah. come across. So same sorts of problems everywhere you go. And um uh, yeah, in talking to colleagues and listening to their stories as well, I thought I'm going to write this down because I think there's a there's a I thought I always thought there's a book out there for senior managers, you know, execs that are thinking about uh, a transformation program or might might even have a transformation underway at the moment. And I thought I can write down what are the things you should look out for, what should you watch out for, what could go wrong, and then you know, armed with that insight. As a senior executive or leader of change, you you might then know some of the questions to ask your transformation team or your program team, and and that's really 
at the heart of the book. So it's structured around five chapters. The first one is setting up for success. So it's all the things that you need to get in place to make any transformation program successful. So in there, it's things like, do you have your goals clearly set out? You know, have you got a common language agreed? So, you know, when we say something, do we all mean the same thing when we say it? Uh, who's accountable for what processes, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And then it moves into um, section two, which is all about things like um, your business strategy and how this ties into the portfolio and sponsorship, you know, business architecture and technical architecture, really important in the context of what we're talking about here. Um, And then It moves through into, um, you know, getting your program management practices in place and then and then eventually your delivery mechanisms. So isn't it funny the amount of times you come across an organisation and they're talking about the delivery methods before they've even defined what it is they're going to deliver. So, you know, then how are we going to package the work up? How are we going to structure it to best deliver? And then all of the change management, which obviously needs to run alongside every stage of the programme to make sure that things are packaged up in a way as well that makes sense to the people who are going to go through the change. Um, And then at the end of each of those uh, chapters in the book, there's um, a set of questions. Uh, And the idea about the idea behind these questions is that, you know, again, if you're a busy executive and you want uh, to, to know the sort of things that you should be asking your transformation team or your program team, you know, heck, there's a list here that you can use that might give you some insight into that. Uh, and the book does give you a little bit by way of explaining what sort of answers you should expect to get. So I like to think of it as a, it's a book I wish many years ago that maybe somebody had given to me before I'd got involved in change and transformation And it just might have opened my eyes up to, you know, kind of the scale of what transformation was and the types of things I might come across and the sort of things that could go wrong, to be honest. Um, So, yeah, that's the book. It's interesting. So a game changer turn poacher. Is, is, yeah. isn't it? it's sort of like yeah these are all the things i used to get away with but here's a, yeah. here's a checklist for to go and check that your guys are not yeah. yes, <laughs> yes 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 um so, so that is the idea really so, so in a way you know what i'd like to hope i know this sounds awful because i'm in the consulting business but if you read this, I'm hoping that people will have enough insight to not need someone to come and tell them what to look for. You know, they will they will be able to have an idea. They'll probably need help to fix it. Let, let's yeah. not give ourselves, you know, because if you get in and you suddenly realise that your programme's not structured effectively and, you know, kind of your processes are broken, uh, you're going to need a practitioner, someone who can come in and help you fix that, or your suppliers are out of control, or procurement's not behaving. You know, you're probably going to need some help. Um, but heck, you might at least know. <laughs> no, no, I agree. And and you know, I've I've personally done quite a lot of transformation program assurance type of activities, and and it's I've got a process. I've got you know a series of questions. A series of things that I should uh, you should be seeing, and yeah. and I've shared those with clients before and and left them with them and, and said you know I'll do this first one, take your team through it. Blah, blah, blah. Surprisingly enough, three to six months down the line, they're on the phone. Can you come in and do the follow up? Because they just they, they I think they um, they like to understand the process that you're going through and the rationale for it, but actually. Having an independent person coming in um, is good at times for the sponsor or for the program director to have that independent view. It it, yeah. it it almost gives them that third third insight, doesn't it? I think as well. I, I mean, I don't know what your view is, but um, I think it also works well with the board. You know, because yeah. they, they see somebody coming in that's got that independence, that's got that. Uh, technical capability that perhaps is lacking in in, in a way and um, you know they, they can put together a very straightforward view of what it is that needs to get fixed in order for things to, to move ahead because um, I, I find that uh, often it's the board that struggle most 
with um, understanding the transformation program itself and where that program is in its journey. And um, I think it's hard to build confidence in the board so that they believe that that program is going to deliver, especially if it's one of those awful programs that's sort of going away into a dark hole for many months and then going to go, ta-da, at the end, you know, two years later, which seriously I advise against these days anyway, because I don't think that works particularly well. But, um, yeah, I think it works well, yeah, maintaining the board's confidence too. Things that I see most commonly are... Um, lack of real uh, clear understanding of what the future needs is going to look like. So, so, so there might be there might be a goal, there might be a set of goals. Uh, you know, there might even be some documentation around something like a blueprint or, or a business model. But not that that real understanding of what it is the organisation is going to look like when the transformation has finished, it's done what it needs to do. I think that's often lacking. Um, and because that's lacking, then all the things beneath all the things beneath it, which get you from A to B, in themselves are then lacking. So I think that yeah. that's one whole area. Uh, and then I think the other is it, it, there's an over focus on managing the mechanics of the program. You know, so you've got lots of really senior executives in the detail of, you know, kind of how things are being delivered. And I don't think that actually helps. I don't think that helps the program to move forward. I think, you know, perhaps um, time better better spent in that senior executive group is, you know, uh, consistently imagining the future and, 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 and painting pictures of that future and making sure that everybody understands what that future picture looks like. Uh, and then having expertise in the program that can manage the mechanics of it, you know, for you and give you the confidence you need. Yeah, I, I was going to come back actually. That and, and the, you've, you've just covered off what I was going to say. It is critical that you have a consistent understanding of that future vision, because uh, uh, I, I find that um, when that doesn't happen. Or you believe it's there, but in reality it isn't. Uh, and it comes back to the point earlier, isn't it, about how do you define transformation? Everybody defines in different ways. So if you've got a vision that one person thinks it's X and another person thinks it's Y, immediately you're, you're, you're on, you're on a, a road to disaster, really, in, in, in spending time up front making sure that everyone's on the same page is essential. I think that's right, Tony. And I think the other thing that um, that I, you know, try to work with boards to do is to make sure that everybody has some skin in the game and everybody's bought in. Because whilst you know you've got a big transformation program underway, everything else has to be subservient. You know, and, and, and personal agendas have to go, have to have to be put away. Um, you need everybody around the top table kind of there in the support of what the business is trying to do because it's just too big and it's too big to fail and too important and you know kind of the um you know the arguments that you get or the tensions you get you know the natural tension that you get between certain departments to some degree you need to put that to one side as well you know and make sure that everybody's standing shoulder to shoulder I am um, I worked with one organization and I remember saying to uh, the CEO before I'd even started, I said, you know, what would, you know, what what does good look for, look like for you? You know, what's like 11 out of 10? And he said, well, obviously I need to get my transformation delivered. But he said, I'd like to do it with all of my top team standing shoulder to shoulder and agreeing for once that it's somewhere that, you know, it's the direction we should go into. He said, because I, you know, I completely believe that if they do, that bunch can achieve anything, but it's impossible to get them to agree. You know, so when I work with organisations, one of the first things I say is before you do anything, just make sure everyone around the top table's on board, you know, and, and, and if that takes a bit of time to get everybody onto the same page, then take that bit of time because yeah. when times get tough, and they will, you know, and when programmes run into difficulty, which they do, you want everybody to be shoulder to the wheel, you know, trying to help you get over what that problem is. You don't want people saying, well, I told you so. If only we'd done X instead, you know, not yeah. particularly 
So, um, yeah. Uh, very relevant, very relevant point. Um, in, in terms of maintaining momentum, um, because you know, certainly on how you define transformation and how I define transformation, it, it is inherently big. It's usually a lengthy process. It's not something that you can do very, very quickly. Um, uh, maintaining that momentum as you go through is is an essential skill. What 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 sort of things do you do to ensure that that can be maintained? Well, I'm a massive fan. So so as I said to you, I don't really get on to delivery until I get into sort of chapter four of my book. But in three, where I do setting up for success, I talk about something that I call packaging, and and I I think this is where. The magic is. So so I don't think there's any place anymore in today's world for programmes that do go into that dark hole for three years and then do the to do fail. It's bound to be wrong. You know, the move, the room, the world will have moved on. So so I think the magic is in what I call packaging, and, and that is looking for ways to break down work into uh, manageable chunks that you can you know, bring forward some benefit delivery and do it quite purposefully, knowing that in some cases by doing so, the whole thing might cost a little bit more, but it does mean that you start to test the water. Um, I've worked with a couple of organisations where they've uh, been, they've tried to implement Agile and, you know, they've, they've tried to do it through a waterfall programme. And, and you can't go, you can't waterfall your way to agile. You know, you agile your way to agile. So I'm very much in this mindset that says, find every opportunity to break down work into manageable chunks that you can deliver some business value. And that might be because they deliver a chunk of benefit, or it might be because just as an organization, you learn from it. You know, you, you develop a skill you might not have had that sets you up for future success. And then focus you know 100 percent on making sure that that early business value is realized and, and and that does you're smiling that does two things two things for me one it de-risks the whole delivery because you're learning as you go um but secondly you know go back to the question of board confidence if they can see stuff getting delivered then yeah you're more likely to continue to get your funding and you're more likely to continue to have the board's confidence. So I hate the word agile. I, um, have, a, I have a section in my book where I have a nice rant about it. You know, I, I, don't <laughs> think, I don't think companies want agile with a big A, as in agile frameworks, but I do think they want agility. Uh, yeah. And I think that, you know, definitely the approach that says break things down, deliver early, get early value, learn as you go. Yeah, fill your boots, great, great practice. So, so that's my approach. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It, it, it's the same, same approach as you know, the, the answer to the question, how do you eat an elephant? It, well, you take the first bite and you keep eating it, aren't you? And, and, and that's the same thing. How, how do you deliver a transformation? Well, you break it down, and you, have, you take your little bites and you continue to eat little bites. And then you talk about it and communicate, ensure that you're making progress. And people come on that journey as opposed yeah. to suddenly breaking that, that, that yeah. thing down in three years' time saying, blood, as you said, da-da, here we go. And, and the beauty of this, so going back to getting transformation right and learning lessons, the beauty of this is you're not wedded to anything for a long period of time. You know, you, you, you put some stuff in place to deliver, the mechanics to deliver, and as you're delivering, you learn from it, don't you? And you go, well, yeah. that worked really well, or we've got a problem with our structure over there, or our methods don't work over here, or that supplier, we hadn't really integrated them fully. And then you go, right, before I now do ne the next chance of delivery, I'm just going to fix those problems. You know, I'm going to fix my structural issues or my cultural issues or my supplier issues or whatever the issues might be. So I think it also promotes um, it promotes a culture where you can improve as you go, which is yeah. so important. You know, and I think I think that a transformation program led well and managed in the right way 
leaves behind a whole raft of lessons for the organisation. It shouldn't be something you look back on and you shiver. And I think too many organisations do right now. They look back and they shiver. You know, that was painful, that was expensive. I think in, a, in, an, in my ideal world, you leave behind a legacy, which is really greater agility, better ways of working, you know, teams that are more integrated, certainly between change and IT and the business, you should leave behind a much more integrated structure. Yeah. And I also think you should leave behind um, um, because you've taken the team with you and lots of people have been involved. You've upskilled them with those core uh, and agile agility style approach to problem solving in, in, in their own right. So, you know, it's, it, it's and that can then help on that sort of continual improvement within processes, within functions, within the organisation as a whole. I think that's absolutely right, Tony. And to build on that, so so I often, in my plans when I'm looking at programmes, I have these things called agility increments, which are delivering skills, ongoing skills that the organisation needs. And, you know, the other beauty is that um, if you leave behind those mechanisms that can manage improvement in the future and you leave behind a healthy backlog when you leave of ideas for improvement, it it means that the organisation can seamlessly transition from big programme world into the new world of operation. They've got the stuff in place and that's often a, a problem area for businesses. It also means, though, that when you're in delivery, you don't have to address every single idea and every single pain point because you're leaving behind a mechanism that things can still happen through. You know, things can still get prioritised and done. Um, And I find that that stops people from behaving like, you know, um, if I don't if I don't get everything 100 percent now, I'm never going to get it. You know, so it does allow the programme to eventually wind up naturally, you know, and, and move on, which all programmes need to, don't they? <laughs> Absolutely. So what's your one takeaway then? What's that what's that number one thing? If you if you could only go into a into your next initiative and know that you get this one thing absolutely spot on, would that what what would that one thing be? Oh, it's it's for me. It's always focus on focus on the eventual the eventual outcomes you're trying to achieve. Uh, everything else is subservient. You know, it, it's kind of like I am there for one reason only, and that is to bring about that uh, step change improvement in a capability, a market, you know, customer behaviour, whatever that is, and everything else is subservient to it. Yeah, it's that guiding light, isn't it? It's every decision can be taken. Are you moving closer to or further away from where we are, where we want to get to? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and uh, that allows you to be super ruthless, doesn't it? Then you know, somebody comes along, and goes, "Oh, while you've got the bonnet open, can I do X?" And you say, "No, nope, doesn't take doesn't take us where we're going. It's a detour." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I also find by having that. Um, if there is discuss in in management teams, you can go back to the to the discussion, the the point in time where that management team, that exec team, all agreed that that was where we were trying to get to, um, yeah. and uh, and that it, it it creates it creates some some um, healthy discussion, but at least you've got that point of reference. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely in the camp for having the discussion. You know, if somebody's got a great idea and they do think this is the right vehicle that you know, by which to deliver that, that idea, let, let's have the discussion. Yeah. But you know, uh, what I wouldn't like to face into is you know, seventy ideas a week being put on the table. You know, that, were, that really weren't, that really weren't related to what we were trying to do. Um, so yeah, I think it's that being absolutely mission mission focused you know every day in every way you know heading for that 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 strategic that strategic goal um yeah Brilliant. well thank you very much for your time and uh, in, in terms of um accessing your book is it available on amazon in, yeah. in uh, yeah. usual book book um uh, bookshops and stuff Yes, it is. You can get it in uh, Waterstones or Amazon, any of them. Getting Transformation Right. Um, 
I think it's two pounds ninety nine the ebook. Thanks, Tony. Really, really good to chat. Super. Okay, Sorry thanks, about- Jane. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jane. That was great. Um, once again, um, I'm really pleased that you've been able to join us and share your experience. Um, for those of you who want to um, take a look at Jane's book, um, have a look on the show notes. There's a link to where you can purchase a copy. The Transformation Leaders Hub is going from strength to strength. So if you haven't already, go and check it out. www.thetransformationleadershub.com With that, once again, Jay, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.